right, good morning, afternoon. We're going to claim morning because it's too dreary to think that it's afternoon. Today, we are going to be talking about poetry, and we are going to be diving into poetry for children. I have good news for all of you. This is your last genre. We have covered all different genres across the semester. We're covering poetry specifically today. Whether or not you love poetry, we're just going to dive in. We're just going to have some fun with it. Uh, so I'm going to start with prayer, just some quick details, and then I'm going to do a read aloud very quickly. Um, none of you signed up for poetry read alouds, and actually I believe you all have finished your read alouds. Is that correct? All right, so I'm stuck with read alouds the rest of the semester. Bummer. Um, and I'll be doing that, and then we're going to take some notes about poetry, specifically poetry for children. And then we'll be reading some poetry today. Uh, and reading it in many different ways. And then I will preview our next class, which will be us writing and interpreting poetry in that next class. Um, so before I jump into our class today, I want to do prayer requests. Any prayer requests? Anything? Um, update for all of you. We closed in our house this morning. So thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Um, with that, I really appreciate it. Um, a lot of prayer went into that. So. Um, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll dive in. Dear God, I just <laughs> thank you for uh, getting us here to this moment, and I just praise you for your sovereignty in it all. God, for having a plan, for knowing uh, where we were going to be today, uh, where we're going to be tomorrow, and, and the, for the health of our students, having them here uh, with us. And God, I just thank you for the opportunity to teach here. It's such a blessing. Um, a blessing to teach these students in person. And God, I just pray for our um, final weeks. God, give these students endurance as they continue to, to work hard, to finish strong. God, we look forward to seeing what you're going to do even in their lives in the next month. In your name, amen. All right. Uh, details for you, just as checking in, you should have submitted your parent love letter number one for me. If that didn't get in, please make sure it gets in as soon as possible. Uh, we're going to do parent letter number two a little later, but you can use the feedback from parent letter number one to help you with two. Um, so we're not going to work on that one yet. Uh, like I said, you're finishing your genre records. Make sure you have enough detailed and list genre records because uh, this is your last chance to do the right, right ones. Um, and I'll talk about specifically what to read in those genre records at the end of class so that we have a refresher on that. Uh, and then you are going to be submitting your creative element for your final project on Thurs uh, Thursday of next week. So please make sure to submit that. Remember, it's just a statement of what are you going to do creatively in your final author illustrator video. Any questions about other assignments coming up? All right, perfect. Uh, so I'm just going to dive into doing a little read aloud. Since we're talking about poetry today, I brought in one of my absolute favorite uh, novels in verse, which we'll talk about a little later, um, my favorite poetry books, which is called Love That Dog. Uh, and not, that's not really why, but it, all the ink is blue, which I love. Um, but this book is actually a poetry book about a boy who hates poetry. So yes. Uh, so I'm just going to read the beginning of it as we sort of jump in and think about this. And then actually next class we're going to deal with one of his poems that he doesn't understand or like. Jack, room 105, Miss Stretchberry. September 13th. I don't want to because boys don't write poetry. Girls do. Not true, but that's what he thinks. September 21st. I can't, can't do it. Brain's empty. September 24th. I don't understand the poem about the red wheelbarrow and the white chickens and why so much depends upon them. If that's a poem about a red wheelbarrow and the white chickens, then any words can be a poem. You've just got to make short lines. And today, we're going to talk about what it takes to make something a poem. Whether or not you love it, whether or not you like Jack, uh, we're going to talk about poetry today. So what I'd like you to do to start is to check out Pull Everywhere, so we're going to do a Pull Everywhere. You've done it before. This one specifically has to be done through the web page. Um, I do actually have a QR code if you want to scan it to get to that web page. You're welcome to do that. Uh, I would like you to answer the question, what is 
poetry. What is poetry to you? What is poetry? So it can be a short statement that you can just type in there and submit. What is poetry? Think about the chapter. Think about your own past experience with poetry. When I say the word poetry, what does that mean? If you need help, let me know. I can help you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe. There you go. What is poetry? Let me just fix it for you. We were going to try it in Google Slides. We're just going to try it right on the website because it's not working. So let's do. All right, try that for me. Did it fix it? Yeah. Ah, see, you all can just speak up. It's fine. <laughs> all right, so what is poetry? Now that you've had plenty of time to think about it. All right, go ahead and hit that submit. Doesn't have to be perfect. Hit that submit. Poetry is a way of talking about life and feelings in an allegorical way. You can have rhyme or rhythm, absolutely. The arrangement of words evokes an emotional response in the reader, good or bad. We're going to see different emotional responses. It often has a deeper meaning you have to dig for. Uh, some of them more literally dig for than others. <laughs> we'll see that in a little bit. Uh, it often has, uh, is written in those really short lines, like Jack said in his poem. We see that, that deeper meaning I'm seeing show up a lot. It's those human struggles, reality. But also, there are going to be poems that are just written for fun. Literally, just so that we can laugh about them. Uh, we'll talk later. Riddles are poetry sometimes. Uh, so that is a good way to think about it. They don't have to rhyme. Yes, thank you. We're going to see a lot of poems that don't rhyme. Uh, it's a very freeing for students to know that not every poem has to rhyme but they're pretty fun uh, when they do. Let's look at the definition in the PowerPoint. So that definition, <laughs> hold on, is a kind of language that says more and says it more intensely than any other language. Um, that's uh, right out of your book, Kiefer and Tyson cite Perrine uh, with that. It's a kind of language that says more and says it more intensely than ordinary language. And you probably have been studying poetry 
for many, many, many years. Uh, you probably actually were exposed to poetry before you even knew it was poetry. Your mother or father potentially sang to you as a child poetry, right? You might have heard it in a, uh, at a children's reading time because they often use poetry because it's very easy to read to young children. So you've been exposed to it for many, many years. Um, I do want to look specifically at poetry for children specifically is going to have the content that is appropriate for children. Go figure. But content that also is, as we've talked about all semester long, accessible to children. Content that appeals to where they currently are in their life. Similar to any other type of children's literature. Sometimes we forget that it applies to, in the same way that the other genres apply as children's literature. Uh, it also needs to connect to their emotions, to that reality. It's preferably not didactic. Someone remind me, what does didactic mean? What's that word, didactic? Claire? It teaches a lesson. It teaches a lesson. So it's not necessarily and preferably not just for the purpose of teaching a lesson. It is for the purpose of that enjoyment, for learning different emotions and connecting to them. And it is ultimately meant to be read aloud which is the fun of poetry, which is why I love it in children's literature. With that in mind, I want to just check in with you about your own opinion of children's literature, I mean of poetry. So let me evaluate for a second. I'm going to give you these smiley faces. And I want you to just choose how you feel about poetry. How do you feel about poetry? Um, these are all, I believe, be anonymous. So, yep, just put your little marker where you feel, how you feel about poetry. Is it poetry, like for kids, or just for adults? Poetry in general. Yep, poetry in general. How do you feel? Oh, we have no extremes yet. So that's a good sign. How do you feel about poetry? As you think about how you feel, think about why do you feel that way? What is the reason for this feeling? Those of you who are, who are sort of on the positive, why do you feel that way about poetry? Why do you feel a little positive about poetry? Helen? I feel like it's like somebody expressed how I was feeling in words that were able to make me feel that and just like way better than I ever could. Yes, yeah, so sort of a mirror. So you saw that mirror in a poetry book or a piece of poetry that you read. Absolutely. Those of you on this other end, don't be shy. I know you exist. <laughs> Why do you pick that side? Caitlin? I just feel like it's not entertaining all of the time. Mm. It's kind of, kind of sad, kind of boring. I hear it's sad and boring. <laughs> sad and boring. Is there any other reasons you all chose that side? Anna? I feel like I need my own opinion about it. And So the author didn't necessarily write a mirror book for you, and then it's frustrating. Ah, what were they thinking? Why not write everything for you? <laughs> That's honestly, that is how your children feel about poetry, right? That range of emotions that you, you have right now is true about your students. Although I would say students probably are also all the way to the green, which some of you might be there, you just don't want a minute. And some of you might be all the way here on this red side, right? Like, I don't want to even touch poetry. Like, give me a historical fiction or a fantasy over poetry. Good news. You can find historical fiction poetry. You can find historical fiction fantasy. So it's a genre, but it also has its own feelers in all of those genres. So we'll see how that looks in a second. One more thing on Pull Everywhere I want you to do. I want you to think about what words describe poetry to you. And I believe you can put more than just one. What are some words that describe poetry? How would you describe it? Mm -hmm. Deep, yep. Not all of it, but some of it. Fluid, oh, see that confusing. <laughs> That's what pushes us down to the red smiley face sometimes. Ooh, dark. 
I'm going to read you some fun poems today, so we're not all in the dark, but it definitely can be. Descriptive, elegant, emotional, lyrical. Yeah, some of it. Some of it also is very clunky. It's very rhythmic. It's not fluid and lyrical, but we find that in poetry often. I see clever. Yeah, we're going to see some clever poems. Harsh. Yeah, we'll see those. I see, notice how confusing just comes the, the, the top, and the rest of those words really are what describes the poem. Confusing is what happens when you read it. <laughs> Still true for our students. Okay, Poetry is a specific type of, of text that takes a little more work to unpack. Next class, we're going to talk specifically about, so how do we interpret it? How do we help students to interpret poetry? How do we help them then write their own poetry that has meaning? But today, we're going to dive into uh, my favorite part of poetry, which is just reading it. Because you can't access it if you are not reading it and getting engaged in it. So we're going to dive into what does a poem include so that we can find those things while we are reading. So these are the elements of poetry. None of these should be a surprise to you, hopefully, if you graduated from high school language arts. And hopefully elementary language arts as well. Uh, so we have rhythm, rhyme, sound, imagery, and shape. We're going to actually do something with each one of these to have an exposure to what do these look like in poems. And then after this, you're going to look at some figurative language in your own poem books you just got uh, so that we can use those as examples. So let's look at rhythm first. So rhythm is the bead of the poetry. So how it has a certain rhythm. Not every poem has that rhythm, but a lot do. So rhythm. We're going to read a poem. All right, and you're going to read it. I, I usually, I'm going to have you stand up. All right, because you're going to have to move around. All right, stand up. It's nice when we're performing our poems to stand to perform. Also, your students sit in chairs way too long. So get them up. All right, we're going to read this poem together. You ready? I have a turkey big and fat. He spreads his wings and walks like that. Oh, oh, it's so painful. Oh, that is so painful. It's like you're reading scripture, which you shouldn't read that way either. We gotta do this better because that's also why you all pick red, uh, red frown faces. It's because poetry is read in such boring ways. So, let's try this. How can we read this better, Isabel? Like we could clap. We're not gonna clap so that we can hear, um, but clapping would be a great way because of rhythm, right? Know that your students will not all naturally have rhythm. So clapping might sound like this through the whole poem, but we could sort of bounce to the beat instead of clap. We sort of have that bounce, all right? All right, what else could we do to make this better? What could we do? Anna? Not awfully quiet, like a funeral. Yes. <laughs> please, please. So, so what, what's the term that you should use when reading a poem? Prosody. Excellent. Prosody. You learn one thing this semester, <laughs> prosody. Awesome. Uh, so yes, we got to have good prosody. So our phrasing and how we, we say it needs to go up and down with the rhythm of the poem. Um, and while we're sort of bouncing, that will help. What about that first line? What can we do in that first line to make it more interesting to read? What do you think, Ellen? If we pause by the comma, it might like, get more emphasis on that. Mm. It's big and fat. Mm -hmm. Oh, I also saw you do this. Big and fat. Can we do that? Big and fat. Excellent. All right. So having a symbol with it, some sort of action is going to help. So, and I think also with our prosody, having that space where we, I have a turkey, big and fat, right? So we sort of pause and move in. All right. What about that next line? What action could we do with that next line? Somebody, what do you have, Elizabeth? Spread your arms out. Oh, yeah. I mean, do what it says. <laughs> Spreads his wings and... Box like that, yeah. If we have that bounce already, we're doing our bounce, we could just move with our bounce, absolutely. Notice this is helping with comprehension of this poem. We're putting some action to the words. All right. His daily corn he would not miss. Where are we now? 
ooh, we could do this. He daily recorded, would not miss. Janessa said this. I've also had students who did literally like, <laughs> which, is, which is not how turkeys eat corn, by the way, <laughs> but it is helping them remember corn eating. All right, so but we're going to do this. All right, he's daily corn, he would not miss. And when he talks, he sounds like this. Now, I need you to be invested. <laughs> and I would, you never want to do something in your classroom and have your students do something you are not willing to do yourself. All right, promise me you will never do that. Right? We have to be invested. And I know we're in a college classroom. But we're going to be invested as if we were in our own classroom. So we, we're going to gobble your very best gobble. <laughs> All right? Because we know, what, what's the name for words that, that are um, the sound? What's the name? What's that poetry? Onomatopoeia. So this gobble, 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 gobble. <laughs> All right? I want to see it. All right, so let's, let's try this. Are we ready? Okay. I have a turkey, big and fat. He spreads his wings and walks like that. His daily corn he would not miss. And when he talks, he sounds like this. Go! <laughs> All right, have a seat. That is how to read poetry. When we think about the rhythm, that's why Isabel initially had that beat. This poem has a natural rhythm to it, right? It bounces sort of along. Not every poem does, but we often see that. Let's look at something else. So we have rhythm. We also have the good old rhyme. Rhyming is where the ends of the words match the same sound as before. Uh, it's not R-I-M-E rhyme. You'll learn about that in phonics. It's Rhyme, R-H-Y-M-E. Uh, we're also going to talk about sound here and how poems naturally have certain sounds that come into them with that onomatopoeia. So we're actually going to do this. I am going to pass this out for you. Oh, I'm in my mess. Um, we're going to be in a parade, a good old poem parade. You didn't think you'd do that today, huh? All right, so a good old poem parade. I want you to read through just the parade poem so that you are familiar with it. Because you wouldn't want to perform it without reading it first. I know we did that with the turkey poem. But this one's a little more complex. So go ahead and read that. Read it through. If there's any words you don't know, we can talk about them. It really is a rum a tee tum A rum -a -tee tum Mm -hmm. okay. All right, try the arumity tum part with me. Ready? Arumity tum. All right, good. Oh, yeah, I know. It goes on. Look at the longer one. See how that's an extra little bit? Let's do that extra little bit. So it's arumity tum a tee tum. So it's got a little extra rhythm to that part. All right. What might we do to read this poem? What might we actually do? You're all worried about it because you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> yes, Ellen? We can get up and march the parade. We're actually going to have a parade today. All right, so um, we're, grab your paper. <laughs> this front row, I want you just to come on the other side of this and just stand. We're going to be spaced out so then Elizabeth and Mason, if you would come over here. Make sure you stay spaced out for me. You all are going to just come in front of your table. Alan, you're right here. And then spread out that direction. We're going to be in front of this table. All right, so spread out. Make sure you are, you're six feet apart for me. OK. <clears throat> which way should we go, Elizabeth? What would you like to do? Which, which direction? We're going to go this way. All right. Now. Uh, we can't just read this. So we just talked about it. You have to act it out. So we're, yes, we could probably walk around in a circle. That seems eh, OK. Of course, in a classroom, we would have practiced this a number of times before I made you get up and use the physicality with reading on a piece of paper. But you're in college. We'll see how it goes. Um, what do we know about a parade? Based on what you've read, what might we need to have in our parade? Drums. We definitely are going to need some drums. So I need some people to have some snares. What other drums could we have? 
Ooh, yep, some big <laughs> old bass drums. Yep, yep. Any other drums we could have? I always wanted to play those big old, like, all the five in front of you. I don't even remember what they were. The quads for the four. What do you have over here? Holding your arm with one of you. Yes, I don't remember either, so we're equal. <laughs> um, we also um, know it's a triangle. Anyone want to be a triangle? It's not going to necessarily say a but it might say a tingling, tingling, tingling. <laughs> and then someone has to be the front. Who wants to be the leader of our parade with the baton? <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Claire. All right, so we're going this way. You ready? We're going to march. Please stay equal distance from the person in front of you like a great band in a parade. Ready? We're going to say the title first. Uh, a Parade by Eve Marion. Ready? A parade, a parade, a rum and tea tum. I, oh, I know. A parade by the sound of the drum. A rum and tea tum, a rum and tea tum, a rum and tea tum, a tea tum. Here it goes down the street. I know a parade by the sound of a beat. Music and feet, music and feet. Can you feel the sound in the beat? A rum and tea tum, a rum and tea tum. A rum a tea tum a tea tum. Stop. Whew. <laughs> I haven't worked out that hard all day. All right. <laughs> you may have a seat. Go back to your seat. Be thinking about other things you could do with this. Notice there's a little bit of rhyming going on in this poem. What are some of the words that rhyme in here? Mason? Tum and drum. We say that over and over. Yep, absolutely. Any others? Kaylin? Street feet. Street feet. So just simple rhyming in there, uh, but that sound, those sounds are just standing out. All right. We're going to do one more that has to do with sound. So sound is where those, that onomatopoeia and the other elements create interesting audio aspects. So we've now done two, and I've helped you with them. This one is your responsibility. All right. It's the one at the bottom of the page called our washing machine. I want you from where you are, don't move, just talk to someone around you about brainstorm. How might you act this out to read it so that we can see what the poem means? All right. So say sort of where you are, talk to someone near you. Go. Don't go too far, ladies. Stay pretty spread out for me. Stay spread out for me. Um, I feel like you could do some sort of like spending yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. yeah. 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 Like for the clicks, you could have to like, I don't know, tap pencils together on yeah. sticks or something. And then for, so yeah, or even snap, like you don't have that snap or clap or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Call the repair Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just trying to figure out like what kind of circle it makes sense. spot. We're going to sit. Just stay sitting because we've done enough standing and walking. Uh, we're going to stay sitting and do this together. All right. So the poem is called Our Washing Machine. Are we ready? All right. Here we go. Our washing machine went whiskity whir. Whiskity 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 whir. Oh, hold on. We just brainstormed. And we just talked about what to do with sound. Make sure our students someday will know how to do this. And I see some of you going, whiskity word, whiskity word. Like it's happening in your brain. Like, you know this. All right, we're going to start over. Invest. All right. Our washing machine went whiskity word, whiskity, whiskity, whiskity word. One day at noon, it went whiskity click. Oh. 
whiskety, 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 click, click, grr, click, grr, click, grr, click. Call the repairman, fix it, click. Do you see how the meaning comes out when you use the sounds well, when you add things to them? That's what brings poetry to life. It should be fun. You should hear this laughter through your classroom when you read poetry with children. All right? Let's look at some others really quickly. We have imagery. So imagery are the images created by the words in the poem. So that's some of what you see with the onomatopoeia, but that is also with the certain words that are used. So I'm going to just bring in some imagery that you are used to. Uh, so I love the Psalms. <laughs> All of those poetic books in the Bible have so much imagery, which also is why some of those books in the Bible are hard to understand because, oh, they're poetry, right? So we have some of that connection. So our hope would be if we can help students understand a whiskey word washing machine poem, we're providing them also with a way to access other pieces of literature like the poetic books in scripture ultimately, right? Um, so this is one that I just love the imagery in Psalm 23. Uh, with the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. I want you to close your eyes. Picture this. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Do you see that shepherd? His rod and his staff, they comfort you. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Oh, it's beautiful. Okay, you can open your eyes. That imagery, you can, it's when a poem has elements in it so that you can see it. Like you can see those pieces. But it doesn't have to not just say it. Like nowhere in there does it say, Christ is a shepherd, he's going to protect you. It says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It's using that figurative language to create a picture. That's what happens for children. Let me show you uh, a book that has imagery for children as well. This book is called Dark Emperor and Other Poems of the Night. Mm. So this, this poem I'm going to show you. Let me just turn on my document camera. Let me switch this over. This poem, I'm not going to show you the picture, and I'm not going to show you the title. So I want you to think about what is this poem talking about? Oh, it's going to be hard to see. Well, you'll just have to believe me. There we are, that's better, a little bit. Okay, I want you to think about what is this poem talking about? As nighttime rustles at my knee, I stand in silent gravity and quietly continue chores of feeding leaves and sealing pores. While beetles whisper in my bark, while warblers roost in branches dark, I stretch my roots into the hill and slowly, slowly drink my fill. And a thousand crickets scream my name, yet I remain the same, the same. I do not rest, I do not sleep, and all my promises I keep to stand while all the seasons fly, to anchor earth, to touch the sky. What, what is this talking about with those, that imagery? A tree. Mm. Why do you think it's a tree, Clint? Um, bark talks about roots and drinking mm -hmm. and then reaching up to the sky but also going anchoring in the earth. Yeah, but it never in this whole poem says tree. That's imagery, right? Those elements that are in there that help us understand the poem without actually even saying it. That requires some comprehension skills on our students. I love to just have students close their eyes and try to picture it, um, but we also would have to break it down. We also could use some of the text features, so check this out. This poem is called Oak After Dark. I wonder what it's about. <laughs> um, but it, it would be great for science. So it talks about the different creatures. It talks about the chores of feeding the leaves and sealing the pores. And all those science concepts with leaves we could talk about. So lots of imagery. 
Uh, and then this is the picture. So it's sort of the, one of those lithoprints of a tree. Uh, so let's look at one more aspect of poetry very quickly. One more, the last one is shape. Shape. Let's check these out. I love the shape of poems. Poems are, can be used in a certain shape to communicate meaning. Do any of you have poems that are in shapes out there in your book? What do you have, Kylie? Um, these trees. Yeah, can you show everyone? So see the poem, the entire book, there's trees. When it talks about a cloud, it's a cloud. When it's a dog, it's a dog. What do you have, Ellen? This one makes a big difference, but they're all different in shape. So like, the words make that one make a big difference. Yeah, so those are actually called concrete poems. When the poem itself is part of the poem itself. So I love this one is actually from Alice in Wonderland. It talks about the caucus race and the long tail. And it's about the tail of the mouse. And the whole description of the, the tail of the mouse goes into an actual tail in the book of Alice in Wonderland. Uh, this one over here is called a furniture bash, where the clock is actually bashing the poem apart. Uh, so fun. The shape can actually add to the meaning. All right, now it's your turn. I've given you enough definitions. I would like you to figure out some of these terms. So I'm going to give you uh, one of these terms. And you and a partner, literally from where you currently are sitting, are going to brainstorm what's the definition of this figure of speech and what's an example. Because these are all things we find in poems that we have to help our students understand. Okay? So I'm going to give the Green Ember group, you all get personification. What is it? An example. You all get metaphor. You all get simile. Carrie, if you could just maybe move back there. Perfect. Okay. This group gets onomatopoeia, and you all get hyperbole. All right, so talk about it for like a minute or so. Don't get too close. And an example. Um, isn't it like making something like inanimate into giving it like personal qualities or traits? Yeah, it's, it's like ascribing human qualities to something that's not yeah. that. So like, Once you have it, you can scroll, roll back to your spot. Be ready to share. We have a Linus? Just got okay, I'll come back. Do you really have hyperbole? Yes. <laughs> okay, good. Mm -hmm. All right, let's share. So let's look at these details. This is literally or should be a review. <laughs> but you have to know these terms in order to make sure you're teaching your students appropriately. So I want to just review them very quickly. So green ember group, personification, what is it and what's an example? Mm -hmm. So what would be an example of that? We said the city is sleeping. The city is sleeping. Cities don't actually sleep, by the way. So city is sleeping is a, is a human quality. Uh, things like your car is running. It, it, it is, but it isn't, right? That could be personification if then we looked at the picture and that car had legs. <laughs> right? Um, so any of those human qualities that are given to inanimate, objects or animals, right? All right, next group. What do you have? Uh, metaphor. What's your example? Oh, we'll just use yours. Love oh, is a rose. Oh, thieves. <laughs> Love is a rose. What are some other examples? Anyone else have examples of metaphor? So comparison without like or as? Life is a journey. Life is a journey. 
Yeah, absolutely. So that it's a comparison. Metaphors are harder than similes. I'm sure when you thought of metaphors just now, instantly five similes came to mind, right? Um, so we, it's easier to teach students similes first. So what are similes, that group? Blanket was as soft as a kitten. Oh, it makes me want to snuggle up with a blanket right now <laughs> for this rain. All right, next group. What is onomatopoeia? Um, like you just talked about, it's words that like describe a sound. Yeah, what are examples? We have lots of them, like bang, zoom, zoom crash, shh. <laughs> Literally any word. You see it a lot in your graphic novels or comics. You see a lot of that onomatopoeia outside of your, your poems as well. All right. And then hyperbole. What is it, ladies? We were saying that it's um, like a, an extreme exaggeration. Like, I must have reviewed that a million times. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not literally, but it's just an extreme exaggeration. I it's must have reviewed that a million times. Or you sleep forever. That type of figurative language that's put into poetry adds to the imagery, adds to the beauty of it. Uh, what's fun is if students know just these five figures of speech, they can start to incorporate them into their poetry. You could do a whole list, a whole anchor chart on your wall where you brainstorm what are examples of all these so they can pull them for their own writing. All right. So that, those are the pieces that make up poems. I put the definitions in here. You all got them. Check. We move on. Let's look at some types of poetry for children. So there's a number of different types of poetry. One is narrative, which is literally just telling a story, where the, the poem itself tells a story. Does anyone have an example of a narrative poetry in the books in front of them? Basically, if it tells a story in the poem. It could be across the whole book or just on one page. We then have lyrical, which is very much the just flowy, beautiful poetry for the sake of the aesthetics or the beauty of it. Lots of imagery. Sort of what I read in The Dark Emperor. Anyone have, have a poem that just is flowing for beauty's sake? What do you have, Elizabeth? Jazz. And it talks about like jazz music and has some, even some songs. Yeah. So. So music really fits in that lyrical poetry, not always, but sometimes in that lyr lyrical type of poetry. And I'm sure if you read those in a certain way, it might sound like jazz, right? So some of the writing is that way. Uh, we also have a limerick. Does anyone know limerick poetry? So this is a specific type of poetry with a specific type of rhythm, and it's very Irish. I'm going to bring you in some limerick poetry next class. It's very rhythmic, and there's a specific form it has to follow. At some point, some of you might have been required to write a limerick, and they're not easy. So that's why I'll bring one in next class. We didn't have time today, but I'll show you next class a good, good quality Irish limerick. And then there's free verse. Does anyone know what free verse is? Oh, Anna? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. literally, it's just when you want to write a poem, but you don't want it to rhyme, you don't necessarily want it to be beautiful, you don't necessarily follow a pattern, it's just words. It's, it's kind of what Jack in A Love That Dog is, doesn't like, is you just put words in short lines and it's kind of free verse. It right? doesn't necessarily have the sounds and the rhythm and all of that either. Okay, haikus. Do you have examples of haikus out there? What do you have, Caitlin? Gaiku. <laughs> so it's haikus about a guy, right? Uh, what, what do we remember about haikus from your schooling? Clint, what do you remember? Uh, the lines have to be five syllables, then seven, then five, and it's almost always about nature of some sort. Mm -hmm. Five, seven, five. Remember trying to count those syllables in school? Right. Why do teachers make you write so many haikus? Like, why is that a default poetry form? Anybody know? Oh, they tricked you. Mason? I don't know if it's a or a syllable. 
Yeah. Yeah, it helps you figure out syllables, even though most of you just sat there and went, uh, elephant, seven, good. <laughs> When we do that with students, it, it does allow us to, in a very small way, to help them with their syllables. It's also a much shorter poem to write. Even though, honestly, I think I've spent more time trying to write those 575 than I have with a long poem. And it's kind of painful when you try to make students write them. Uh, there's some fun ones in the library. I encourage you to look for them for your genre record. Uh, there's one uh, about a cat. So they're all this life story of this cat, but told in, in um, the haikus. So Clint, you're right, they're often in more about nature, but recently authors have been pushing the boundaries of that, like an entire book about things that guys might like to do. Uh, whether or not you like that book or not, it's kind of an interesting concept. Uh, but there is some about nature in the, in the CMC. Tricky, just a key. If you read a, read a haiku book for your genre record, that's less, less words per page. Harder to understand, but less words per page. Just, just telling you. All right. And then we have invented forms. So this is when, uh, sort of in the same category of what Anna said with free verse, invented forms is, I don't necessarily want to just put words on a page. I'm going to make up my own structure for a poem. So I'm going, to I'm going to give it its own pattern that maybe no one has done frequently or doesn't have a name. I'm just going to do it myself. And I'm going to do it through my whole book or my whole poet, poetic life. Uh, and then we have these concrete shape poems. I'm going to show you a couple more out of Ellen's book because it's fascinating. Uh, so it's fun for students to do these concrete poems because they can create it to a shape. And the shape actually helps them understand it. So let's look at a few of these. Oh, lovely. Thank you. Hanger's a good choice. All right, I'm going to switch the camera. So here's an example. I wonder what this poem's about. Hanger. So it says, I hang out in blue jeans and old comfy shirts. I hang out in blouses and long frilly skirts. I hang out in sports coats and sweaters and shawls. I even hang out with no clothes on at all. Oh, hanger. Goodness. <laughs> this one, look at this. Dominoes. Hmm, fun. Fun. Xylophone, shaped like a xylophone. This one. Is, is actually, they're using the words, it's called pop-up. The ball pops up, and then it falls back down. Someone's under it, under it, under it, blundered it. <laughs> so this is a really fun, poetic medium for your students. Have them think about what's the poem talking about. It's pretty simple. Now, to start with, I would do something like Kylie's book, where I, can I take this? Where I would give them a shape, and I have them just fill it in with the words. And then we could brainstorm a little further, because this is a little more complex. All right, I'm just going to leave these here, ladies. All right, let's look at some other forms. So those are all the types of poetry. Here are some forms that you might also see. So we have nursery rhymes. Someone give me an example of a nursery rhyme. Do you remember any of those? Nursery rhymes? Mason, what do you have? Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle. Help her out. Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the cow. Jumped over the moon, the? And the dish ran away with the spoon. Oh my goodness. OK, so that's a nursery rhyme. They literally put rhyme in the title to help you remember. It's a poem. It's a very short poem. That's not why, but it helps, right? The hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock, right? All of those are short, short little rhymes that are poem. We also have spoken word. Has anyone heard spoken word? What is it? What is spoken word? It's a little hard to describe. Ellen, you want to try? Yeah, so the spoken word I've heard, it just seems like it's typically somebody who's talking very passionately about like a specific topic. And then a lot of times they use a lot of imagery to talk about that. And they do it in a kind of very dramatized way. So they're moving around a lot and they're using their hands and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Yep, that's the definition of spoken word. That is spoken word. 
it is often a pre-written poem that is only meant to be performed, not meant necessarily to be read. It's a poem meant to be performed in a very specific way. I encourage you to look up some spoken word. There's some really great uh, spoken word about biblical concepts out there that I love to use um, because it's really a poetic description of a concept. But it, there's others as well. So your older students could maybe do, do spoken word. Those third, fourth, fifth graders are on the edge of being able to do very little bits of it with examples. It's very performative. It's very performative. We also have songs, which we've already talked about, our forms of poetry. Humor. Humor, so those riddles, we see a lot of humorous poetry out there uh, that's just literally for the purpose of fun. No other reason. Um, also, no, some social media posts can end up to be like poetry. I mean, a Twitter having only that many words is actually a pretty solid form of where you can see poetry. And people use it that way. Uh, your students could, might already be using it that way, even at a young age. It's a great way to talk about it. And then novel and verse. You all already read a novel and verse with Inside Out and Back Again. Um, oh, I was going to pull it. The novel and verse. Talk to me about what it's like to read a novel and verse. What was that like to read Inside Out and Back Again? Or a, like a chapter book that was a poetry book? Mason? At first, it was kind of hard to, like, I don't know, get the flow of reading like mm. you would a normal novel. But mm -hmm. as you get used to it, like, I don't know, after a quarter of the book, you kind of could read just. Yeah. Any other thoughts about novel and verse, what it was like to read so many poems back to back to back? Yeah. I felt like you, like, you couldn't get the same thing accomplished if it was just a normal story. Like some of the stuff would have been like cut out or too insignificant, but like from her perspective and written like that, it like conveyed something different. Yes. So there are certain books that only can be written best in that novel and verse format. We see a lot of those. I brought one in. There's a lot of them in the CMC. Uh, but they are actual chapter books where there are poems for each section. This is a great one by uh, Margarita Engel. Uh, she writes a lot about life down in Cuba. So this is a great one to check out. This one, Love That Dog, is one that I just love. Uh, but it is this whole book. There's about that many words on the page, right? Uh, and actually has different poems throughout. Uh, this one specifically talks about Jack hating poetry, but also his relationship, go figure, with, that, with a dog. Uh, it's not an easy book to read. There's some hard parts in it. But it's a, it's a way to tell a story in a different, in a poetic way. Uh, we actually have seen a lot of these pop up recently because once you get past some of those poetic elements, it's a little easier for some students to read. And some students can access literature this way in a way they might not be able to with a full chapter book that's not a novel in verse. Uh, so it's a great thing to think about having in your classroom, but they're fun. So this one has a lot of humor in it. This one is historical fiction. Uh, so you have a lot of different genres that can be covered in it. So let's just briefly, as we head towards the end of class, talk about ways we can use poetry in our classroom. So. I would not do all of this if you couldn't actually use these books in your classroom. And then there's strategic ways to use poetry. Uh, and there's ways to schedule it in your classroom. So I wouldn't necessarily just do a poetry unit. Because then we, we show that poetry only should be read when you're doing a poetry unit. And it sort of segments it. One of the best ways you can incorporate poetry in your classroom is to do it throughout the year. So specifically choosing maybe once a week or every morning, you share one poem. I worked with a teacher who their morning message was actually a poem every week. And then the students would copy that poem into their journal. So just looking at it and copying it. And then their job across the week was to work on how do I figure this poem out? What do I do? to figure this poem out. And so they would copy it. They would look up the vocabulary, and they would write down the vocabulary. They would make some guesses. They would talk about the poem that week as a class. And by the end of the week, they would write up their own understanding of the poem. So the teacher would use that poetry throughout the week to help focus on different topics she was covering in her class. So if she was teaching something like cause and effect, she would pick a poem 
uh, that included some cause and effect so that the students were working on that every morning and then she could reference it when she taught it later in the day. And so it was an, a, a shared text in the class and they were learning that, that along the way. And then by the end of the year, they had this large collection of poetry with the meanings inside of it. Uh, she would give them poems like Robert Frost, um, Stopping in the Snowy Woods on a Snowy Day. Uh, she would give them silly poems that she found, uh, riddles every once in a while to get the meaning. Uh, but it was a really great way to incorporate it. Another way to incorporate it is choral reading. Does anyone know what choral reading is? We're not that creative. Choral reading is reading as a choir. So reading all together. Most education vocabulary you can get by looking at it. We're, we're very helpful that way. So I'm going to read you, or we're going to read together, do some choral reading. And that is when your students are all going to read some things together. You provide opportunities for them to continually read at the same time. It helps them with fluency. It helps them with reading confidence. So they're not reading on their own. And we've done a little bit of that with our poems already, but I want to show you how it works with a book. So I brought in a classic poem, a classic. Now, I say classic because I, I want you to be exposed to it, this old lady and her fly. But you'll see what I'm talking about as I go through. It's, um, this is an interesting poem that we have just assumed is just OK. So we're going to read through it. I love this book because it has holes in it. And you'll see why. All right. So once you start catching on, feel free to join in. There was an old lady who swallowed a fly. It's illustrated by Pam Adams. There was an old lady who swallowed a fly. I, I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. Here it says, she swallowed a fly. Why? Can't wait for it? There was an old lady who swallowed a spider that wriggled and wriggled and jiggled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. Gruesome book. There was an old lady who swallowed a bird. How absurd to swallow a bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider. Now watch what this book does. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wriggled and wriggled and jiggled inside her. Help me out. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Perhaps she'll die. Mm. All right, her hole's getting bigger. There was an old lady who swallowed a cat. Well, fancy that. She swallowed a cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. She swallowed the, the bird to catch the spider that wriggled and wriggled and jiggled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. There was an old lady who swallowed a dog. What a hog to swallow a dog. She swallowed the dog to catch the cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. How absurd to swallow a bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wriggled and wriggled and jiggled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know why she swallowed the fly. Probably because it, it just was buzzing around. Let's be honest. She there was no lady who swallowed a cow. I don't know how she swallowed a cow. She swallowed the cow to catch the dog. What a hog to swallow a dog. She swallowed a dog to catch the cat. Fancy that to swallow a cat. She swallowed the cat to catch the bird. How absurd to swallow a bird. She swallowed the bird to catch the spider that wriggled and wriggled and jiggled inside her. She swallowed the spider to catch the fly. I don't know. There was no lady who swallowed a horse. She died, of course. <laughs> now let me tell you, this is a very old book. This is a very old poem. This poem, since then, people have been like, I don't know about that. Sort of like Grimm's fairy tales. Like, we don't use the original Grimm's fairy tales. They have been adapted because the rhythm and the repetition of this poem is wonderful. 
for students. So you'll find there was an old teacher who swallowed a fly, and it talks about things from her classroom that she swallows. Uh, there is different holidays. You'll find that people on different holidays swallow different things. Uh, so there's, a, there's some trending of this, different variations of this. Honestly, it's becoming more of a traditional poem in children's literature. So you'll see that sort of theme through things. Um, you will also see, uh, I used to have a teacher who had an old lady who was a puppet. And you actually could fit the things inside of her. So she got bigger and bigger. Anytime you can use puppets with books, it's great. I don't know about the lady who swallowed a fly. <laughs> it was interesting. Um, but it's fun to have that. Some other things in terms of classroom uses, you could just read a, a poem aloud. We've done that. We've covered it. You should always do it. It's lovely. Um, morning message I already talked about. Reader's theater. Can anyone tell me what reader's theater is? What is the reader's theater? Tori, you're just smiling like you know. Do you know what reader's theater is? Just like having this person acting it out with your classmates in front of the class or in small groups. So fun. Yet again, she didn't want to say it because she knew. You all love my little cart. All right. So I brought in a reader's theater for us. I just need three, three helpers. Three helpers. I know, you're all pointing to each other. Or two. Tori, you want to do it? Why don't you do it from right there? You just can talk pretty loud from right there. We would typically have you come up, but for sound purposes, we'll just have you right there. Um, would you like to be the narrator, the pirate, or Timmy? Can I be the pirate? The pirate. It's all you. Make sure you, you read over your parts so that you know. Would you like to be Timmy or the narrator? The narrator, there you go. Who would like to be Timmy? Perfect, Mason. <laughs> Here you go, Timmy. OK, so look over your part. Typically with students with Reader's Theater, the way it is, it's sort of like Tori said. So it's an opportunity to act, but you would get to hold and read the script. So it's not a memorization. You're not doing lots of staging. You might wear a costume. If it wasn't COVID, I absolutely would have brought Tori an eye patch to wear or a hook to hold. Uh, but it's really just the opportunity to have repeated reading of a text. So our students, when they do Reader's Theater, they read something over and over and over again to practice it, and then they perform it. So they get that repeated reading practice for fluency specifically. We'll talk about that again in Methods 1 when you come to me uh, later in your program. All right, ladies, are you, are you ready? This Reader's Theater specifically is a poem. So not all Reader's Theater fits in this genre, but this is some children's literature poem Reader's Theater. All right, go for it. The whole class was excited on their first day back to school. Our teacher was a pirate, and an eye patch made him cool. At first, we thought it was funny when he started yelling, or started all our classes by waving his hooked hands around and yelling, lads and lasses. But then when Timmy Timmons broke his pencil lead in art, we figured out a pirate teaching kids is not that smart. Mr. Blackbeard? Call me Captain. Can I sharpen up my pencil? Stay in your seat, you scallywag. I'll sharpen your utensil. Our teacher yanked his cutlass out and swung it through the air. He missed poor Timmy's pencil and instead cut off his hair. <laughs> At least math class was safer, but our brains still turned to mush since pirate explanations seemed to come out in a rush. Captain, can you help me? I don't understand this fraction. Divide the loop by five. Avast. It'll be just one transaction. And then, of course, in English class, things seem to get worse, as everything we learned last year seemed headed in reverse. Captain, all this grammar stuff is totally confusing. Uh-oh. It is confusing when you know how to Me and my ye and you, ahoy, ye, do ye be snoozing? Our final class was gym. Timmy Timmons started crying. Dodgeball played with cannons is completely terrifying. <laughs> the only good to come from this whole pirate thing, alas, is that we won the school award for best behaving class. Of course for that, we all have Timmy Timmons we should thank. We've all been too afraid to speak since Timmy walked the plank. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Thank you very much.
We might actually have to snap because it's poetry. Uh, so reader theater is fun. See how it naturally got this rhythm. You would want to practice it with your students. You could get different passages that went along with their reading level. You could partner them up so they could each read together. So if it was a reader that wasn't as strong, they could do it that way. But it's a way of reading poetry in a safe environment and fun. So you also could do in your classroom some poetry readings. So you could just literally have students prepare to read. I would love if you had like a stool, you got some mood lighting, and then you did all snap. I think that's necessary for a good poetry reading. Uh, you also could do tongue twisters. Uh, so does someone have a book that's an example of tongue twisters? What do you have, Mason? What's that book called? Um, a poem. Yes, can I? Poems that tangle your tongue. Can I steal this from you? This is my special favorite. This is your special favorite? <laughs> from what I looked. Excellent. All right. So I'm, I'm just going to read this special favorite poem to you. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so know that tongue twisters often show up as poems. So they have these repeated elements. They use alliteration. Someone help me out. What's alliteration? Janessa? Same first letter every word, which is why when Sally sells seashells by the seashore, that's so hard, because it's the same letter. It's also some of the same sound as well. All right, so this is Walter the Waiter. This might be bad. <laughs> Walter the Witter called a waiter. Waiter over here. I want some water, waiter. Water, waiter, is that clear? The waiter brought some water. Walter Witter shouted, wrong. This water is really watered down. I like my water strong. The waiter brought more water. Witter Witter was upset. This water's dry, said Walter. I like my water wet. Bring me wetter water, waiter. Water Witter, Walter Witter said. The waiter bought a pitcher full and poured it on his head. <laughs> <laughs> so tongue twisters are poems. They're really fun to do. I'm going to keep this Mason. Uh, they're really fun for students to do. They love tongue twisters. It's great if you're working on a certain letter of the alphabet or a certain sound. Bring in a tongue twister and have them challenge you to reading them. Because that also gets students to read them more. Right? So if they're challenging you, I could read this faster than the teacher because I am young and youthful. But really, they love it. Does anyone know um, the, which Dr. Seuss book is full of riddles? Remember? Check out Fox and Socks. Fox and Socks is a really fun Dr. Seuss book. Um, know that we, we, I was in a school one time, the librarian set up a riddle tongue twister competition where each class had to send a tongue twister reader to class. It was sort of like a spelling bee. So they like faced off and read their tongue twister and we got faster and faster and faster until we had the tongue twister master. Uh, and it was a fun way to have students reading, because they're reading poems at that point. They're learning to read words well, and they had to practice it, so that repeated reading. Uh, and then music, we've already talked about. So the opportunity to have music in your classroom, you're going to cover that in uh, art and music if you take that course. Uh, so I'm not going to go into it much. Mrs. Traeger is an excellent guide on how to use music in your classroom. All right, I have one thing before we sort of wrap up class, and I want to talk about Dr. Seuss briefly. Because uh, if we're going to talk about poetry, we better talk about Dr. Seuss. So tell me, what are your experiences with, with good old Dr. Seuss? Because we use him and his writing in our classrooms. What are your experiences? Mm -hmm. No one's read Dr. Seuss. Perfect. What have you done, Clint? I mean, like, my parents read me a lot of Dr. Seuss when I was a kid. Um, but I mean, other than that, I don't know. Did you have a favorite? Um, I liked green eggs and ham. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do, you, do your parents ever make you eat some green eggs and ham? No. Oh, there's some parents. Vanessa, what is your experience? We had like a Dr. Seuss party in kindergarten, and we would do, like, we made a cat in the hat, like, the same, like, story, and, like, we made ourselves cat in the hat, and then we did a green eggs and ham party, like, on Friday. Fun. So are you saying you destroyed your entire classroom, Cat in the Hat style? No. Is that what happened? Okay, good. <laughs> if you don't know what I mean, check out Cat in the Hat. Literally just destroys their house and then cleans it up. 
Uh, what other experiences with Dr. Seuss? Tori? I got about four copies of Oh, the Places You'll Go when I was a senior. <laughs> yes. 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 yes! Talk about a Dr. Seuss book that is actually for graduates. It's not really children's literature as much as it's for new adults, right? But we love it. We love, like, it's a great idea when a child goes to kindergarten, have their teacher sign it every year, and then you give it as a gift. It's lovely. A lot of people read it as speeches. So children's literature, read at graduation. It's a good market point for children's literature. Love it. All right, other experiences with Dr. Seuss? Elizabeth? I guess it's similar to what Vanessa said, Dr. Seuss Day was like a thing, and teachers were like, wear a little cat in the hat hat. So they would serve green eggs and ham. Mm -hmm. Did anybody make truffle trees at any point? Okay, there was a point when the Lorax sort of went through because the Lorax movie came out and everything was like a truffle tree everywhere you went, right? Uh, so as you look towards reading poetry, some people love Dr. Seuss and use it in their classrooms and use it a lot. Some people do not like Dr. Seuss at all. Just beware, it's not, a, it's not an even like, oh, Dr. Seuss, everyone loves it. Uh, there's some people who don't love Dr. Seuss. Does anyone know why? We talked a little bit the other day, but in terms of his form of writing, what, what don't people like about Dr. Seuss? Claire? Yes, and some of them only follow the pattern if you're reading the poem in a certain way, right? So you can only sound it out if you're reading it in a certain way. So it's hard for children to read it, right? Dr. Seuss also, there's a lot of controversy because he puts po um, political concepts into his poems under the guise of fun. Uh, we talked about that the other day. Uh, so as you do your genre record for this next class, Know that I only want you to read one Dr. Seuss book. You're not allowed to read seven. All right? And if you have already read some Dr. Seuss, you can't count it. Like, go and actually read Dr. Seuss again. Because sometimes, when you read it again as adults, as I'm sure you've noticed this semester, it's read differently. And you see different things you never noticed before. So for your genre record, you're going to read your last pages. That means that you have read over... 2,000 pages of children's literature this semester. Whoa. Yeah, that's a lot. Well done. Well done. It's taken a lot of your time. Hopefully you found some books that you really enjoy. We know you found books that you don't enjoy. So that's great. So we have a great list. Uh, so remember when you're reading your poetry, you can only do one book that's a collection of poems. If you do a collection of poems and you're writing your detailed genre record, Remember that you are just going to summarize the collection. So for example, with these, this, uh, these concrete poems, this is a collection of concrete poems. Okay, I would summarize, these poems are all about things that are this shape. All right, so you can do that. You also are allowed to read one novel in verse. You can only count 50 pages, but you're allowed to read a novel in verse. You cannot count inside out and back again. So go find a new one. Don't be a cheater. And you can read one Dr. Seuss. So if you do those three, you just have to find four other books, look for some other forms of poetry out there. If you can't find some or you want to use a digital text, you're welcome to do that as well. Um, if you're worried about whether or not it counts, just ask me, send, shoot me an email, all right? Also remember your creative element for the final project is due next Thursday. Please submit those so I can approve them. You're on a record number eight. Any questions before I let you go? Anna? Well, when you said that you can only do one collection. Like, how does that work with, like, the pages thing? Because it's probably only be, like, one or two pages for that, but you read more. So you would read, you can't read any more than 50, so 50 yeah. pages. So if it's a collection, like, it's a nursery rhymes collection, read up to those 50 pages. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Anything else? All right. Thank you all very much. See you later.